Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Spud Woodward, Governor's Appointee Commissioner for the State of Georgia and Chair of your Atlantic Menhaden Management Board, and I want to call our meeting to order. Our first item of business is you have a draft agenda. Uh, are there any uh, requested modifications or changes to the agenda? If so, raise your hand and be recognized. Don't see anything. You see anything, Tony? Nope, you're all good. Okay. Uh, any opposition to adopting the agenda as presented? Again, raise your hand, be recognized. Okay, don't see anything, so we'll consider the agenda adopted by consent. Uh, next item of business is the approval of the proceedings from our February 2021 meeting. Uh, you have those uh, in the materials. Uh, are there any recommended changes, edits, improvements, modifications? If so, raise your hand. If not, is there any opposition to adopting the proceedings as presented? Again, raise your hand. Okay, don't see anything, so we'll consider the proceedings adopted by consent. Also, just wanted to point out that we have uh, Rob in France uh, filling in for Bill Hyatt today, so uh, welcome, Rob. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, Mr. All right, our next item of business is uh, public comment. And uh, Kirby, I believe we have a couple of folks queued up for public comment. Uh, we've got a pretty full agenda. Uh, so I'm asking that you please keep your comments to three minutes or less. Um, I think we'll, we're going to have a timer up on the screen. You can be able to do that. Yep, Mike can pull it up in just a sec. There we go. All right, who's who's first, Kirby? Uh, it's your it's your call, Chair uh, Woodward. If you want to start with either Tom or Phil. All right, how about Phil? How about you lead off? Um, again, just ask you to you keep your comments within three minutes. We appreciate it. All right, can you hear me before we start the timer here? Yes, we got you loud and clear. I got you loud and clear. All right, now I sent you all an email at uh, one thirty this afternoon so you can follow along. Uh, I'll try to put some inflection on in and my voice so I don't uh, put you to sleep. But the purpose of these comments today is to present the current status of Atlantic Menhaden and their predators and describe what can be done if this board decides to act. <laughs> Data and reference. <laughs> The latest science is the Ecological Reference Point study published last year. It clearly states there are plenty of Atlantic menhaden in the Atlantic Ocean. However, there are not enough Atlantic menhaden available to feed striped bass, bluefish, and weak fish to ensure their survivability. The board did lower the total allowable catch of Atlantic menhaden on the Atlantic coast by 10% from 216,000 metric tons to a little over 192,000 metric tons. However, the board did not did nothing to reduce the reduction fishing cap of 51,000 metric tons from the Virginia portion of the Chesapeake Bay. This cap represents 26.5% of the total allowable catch for the entire Atlantic coast. Clearly, overharvesting is occurring in the Chesapeake Bay. I have documented the devastating decline in commercial harvest of striped bass, bluefish, and weak fish in the Chesapeake Bay region for the last 23 years. I've also documented the devastating decline in commercial fishermen in both Maryland and Virginia for the last 20 years, almost up to 700 now. Research published by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation on their website last September reported that Atlanta Menhaden diet for striped bass has gone from 70% to 8% in the Chesapeake Bay. Research conducted at William and Mary over the last 50 years indicates that there are not enough Atlantic menhaden in the main stem of the Chesapeake Bay to feed the osprey. Management is about taking action to achieve a specific goal. The goal of this board is to manage the Atlantic menhaden fishery in a manner which equitably allocates the benefits between all user groups. Today, 71% of the total allowable catch for the entire Atlantic coast is being allocated to a Canadian-owned reduction fishery 
based on current allocations of this board and Virginia. So what's a solution? Another five to 10 years of research is not required. Yeah, I read the technical report that was attached to the, the announcement for this meeting. You have all the research and data you need to make a management decision today. Limit the reduction fishery to three nautical miles outside the exclusive economic zone. Do this in the form of a motion today. I'm requesting any member of the board to make this motion to start the process. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Phil, and thank you for, for keeping your comments within the time. We appreciate it. All right, uh, Tom Lilly, you're next. We got um, you know. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. yes Am I coming through? You. Okay, great. Yes, uh, we can hear you. Uh, but yeah, thank you for the opportunity here. Uh, I have a question. If you all will click on the attachment I sent you in my mail to you on Sunday, it's titled Virginia um, Allocation. It's a picture of the Chesapeake Bay and uh, some of my conclusions. So if you could take a minute and go back and click on that attachment. Okay. Members of the board, the question here is, uh, is about 50 to 60% of Omega's catch of Bay Menhaden under your Virginia allocation of Menhaden Menhaden that would have come to Maryland, but for the fishing in Virginia. Another way to put this question is this, is Omega's quota from Virginia being partly filled with fish that belong in equity and possibly in law to Marylanders? You can picture Chesapeake Bay for a minute, down to the entrance of the bay. I think we can agree there that uh, 50-50, there's probably a 50-50 split there of the Menhaden that are migrating in between Maryland and Virginia. Each bay is about 100 miles long and about 2,000 square miles in area. So we know right there from the get-go coming into the bay that 50% of those fish that purseiners are catching are fish that would get to Maryland except for that fishing. 50% half right there. Uh, real quickly, you can you know, hope you read my diagram that as that catching moves north, uh, what happens is the schools of Menhaden disperse out into Virginia. Virginia gets their Menhaden, but that group of fish that's headed toward Maryland, partly for Virginia, partly for Maryland, proceeding up to the Maryland line, uh, those are the fish that are ultimately going to get to Maryland by the time they get to Reedville, uh, which is about you know five miles below the line where a lot of this fishing takes place uh, past the Rappahannock River. I think it's fair to say, as I did in that red circle, that almost all of those schools caught there are Maryland's fish, are fish that were bound for Maryland. And if they did not catch them there, they would be in Maryland. So we're talking about a major issue here. Uh, I wish I had more time to talk about it, but I don't see any way to solve this uh, inequitable treatment of Maryland other than by moving the factory fishing out into the U.S. Atlantic uh, north of the entrance of the bay. If you did that, they would not be fishing from this common stream. They would be fishing from the plentiful uh, Atlantic Menhaden stream. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate you keeping your, your comments brief. All right. Uh, anybody else, uh, Kirby or Tony, that would like to make public comment? Uh, we have, uh, I see Jeff, Kalen, I see your hand up. And then, okay. go ahead, Jeff. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Woodward. Um, good afternoon, uh, members of the, of the management uh, board. I'm uh, Jeff Kalen, Blue Lunch Fisheries, um, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure. Uh, I guess this is technically uh, a time to comment for things not on the agenda. I'm not sure that that was what happened uh, with the previous comments, but 
my question to you is I, I would like to comment on the recommendations of the plan review team to the board. Um, you know, that's repeated on uh, what page four of the memo and also page 10 of the FMP review. Is this a good time to do that or will you go back to the audience after that topic has been introduced uh, later? No, well, why don't you go ahead and, and take care of that, Jeff? I think that. You know, okay, thanks. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> you can do it in I don't have much more time left. My introduction took up most of my time. I can do that easily. So I just wanted to support um, the review of the Amendment 3 allocation provisions concerning the uh, incidental catch allowance. Um, it was my understanding from the beginning uh, that this was uh, to be utilized after the directed fishery in a state closes and uh, we incur I encourage the board to clarify that um, because I think that it is being abused now in certain parts of the coast. I'm referring to 13 million pounds of 6,000 pound uh, incidental catch um, harvested by Maine. We are, we're under 20,000 here. Uh, in New Jersey, we supported that 6,000 pounds to allow our gill netters to fish after our directed fishery was closed. I think the prob this is uh, becoming a significant problem. And while it may not be a biological issue, um, it certainly is an issue of equity. And I'd hope that perhaps uh, either the 6,000 pounds can be eliminated um, or that uh, it could be tied to a cap that would be proportional um, relative to the Amendment 3 landings allocations that the states have received. So that's my comment, and I really appreciate the opportunity to take to do that now, uh, Spud. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Anyone else uh, from the public that would like to comment? I don't see anybody in my the box down there so we will uh, proceed ahead with you our next item is to consider the fishery management plan review and state compliance for the 2020 fishing year uh so kirby i'll turn it over to you okay thank you chair woodward uh good afternoon this is kirby roots murdy I have a presentation on the 2020 Fishery Management Plan Review. That document was included in supplemental materials. Next slide. So I will walk through in this presentation an overview of each section in that report, status of the FMP, status of the stock, status of the fishery, compliance requirements, and then the PRT, the plan review team's recommendations. Next slide. So Amendment 3 approved in 2017 and implemented starting in 2018 is the most current management document that the fishery operates under. For notable changes, such as board actions from 2019 to 2020, we'll start with the Chesapeake Bay reduction fishery cap. As many of you are aware, the bay cap was exceeded in 2019 and to account for that overage, the cap was adjusted for the 2020 fishing season to 36,000 metric tons. Following feedback and discussion by the management board in May and August of last year, the board approved Menhaden specific ecological reference points or ERPs for management. And in October of last year, the board set the total allowable catch or the TAC for the 2021 and 2022 fishing seasons at 194,400 metric tons based on the board approved ERPs. The TAC is estimated to have a 58% and a 52% probability of exceeding the ERP target in 2021 and in 2022 respectively. Next slide. So with the ERPs adopted last year that did adjust the reference points used for management, I'll note that based on the 2017 values, the F estimate is below the threshold, but not quite at the target, while fecundity is above the target. Therefore, the stock is not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. Next slide. 
So total commercial Atlantic Menhaden landings in 2020, including directed incidental catch and episodic set aside landings are estimated at 184,150 metric tons or approximately 405 million pounds, which is an approximate 12% decrease relative to 2019. The non-incidental catch fishery landings, which is directed landings plus landings that occur under the episodic set-aside program, total for 2020 as 177,827 metric tons or 392 million pounds, which is a 13% decrease from 2019 and represents approximately 82% of the coastwide TAC. Landings from the incidental catch fishery are estimated at 6,330 metric tons or 13.9 million pounds and do not count towards the coastwide tech. Next slide. All right, so moving on to the reduction fishery for 2020, uh, reduction or harvest for reduction purposes is estimated at 124,600 metric tons, which is a 17% decrease from 2019 and 11% below the previous five year average of 140,380 metric tons or 309 million pounds. Omega Proteins Plant in Reedville, Virginia is the only active Atlantic Menhaden reduction factory on the Atlantic coast. In 2020, the reduction plan uh, plant was shut down for three weeks due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Anecdotal reports also indicated that in addition to the pandemic, bad weather may have contributed to lower harvest. As previously noted, the reduction fisheries cap in the Bay, known as the Bay cap, was reduced for 2020 based on the 2019 overage. Landings in the Bay were approximately 27,700 metric tons, which is under the adjusted cap by approximately 9,000 metric tons. So result, the cap for 2021 uh, is set at approximately 51,000 metric tons. So next slide. On this slide here, uh, the figure shows landings from the reduction in the bait sectors through time. So reduction landings on the left axis and bait landings are on the right. It's important to note that, the, that each of these have different scales with the reduction landings an order of magnitude larger than the bait landings. But overall, what you can see is that there has been a, a general decline in the reduction landings over time while bait landings have been increasing. Incidental catch landings in 2020 are estimated, as mentioned before, at 6,330 metric tons, which is a 30% increase relative to 2019 and the highest level in the time series. Maine, Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey reported incidental catch landings, approximately 88% from Persane and 8% from Gill Nets in 2020. Maine accounted for 97% of total incidental uh, fishery landings in 2020 and incidental catch trips in 2020 were higher than trips from 2016 through 2019. Moving on to the next slide. The episodic set aside program in 2020 uh, was set again at 2,160 metric tons or 4.76 million pounds. Uh, landings were estimated at 2,080 metric tons. Maine and Massachusetts were the only participating states. And with their combined landings being under the episodic set aside, approximately 80 metric tons or 176,000 pounds were redistributed uh, to the other states in the fall of 2020. Next slide. So on this slide, uh, it demonstrates quota performance in terms of the number of transfers over time. So uh, in 2020, quota transfers remained uh, relatively high for the 2020 fishing season. There were at least 16 instances of quota transfers 
and as you can see in a number of uh, instances that involved multiple states so it wasn't necessarily just one state receiving and one state giving next slide uh, so moving on to biological sampling requirements just as a reminder, non-de minimis states require to conduct biological monitoring based on their landings as well as their geographic region. So for Del or Maine through Delaware, uh, the requirement is one 10 fish sample per 300 metric tons. For Maryland through North Carolina, it's one fish sample per 200 metric tons. In 2020, Maine, Massachusetts, and the Potomac River Fisheries Commission fell short of the required samples. I'll note that while North Carolina indicated they had fallen short of the requirement as shown in the FMP review and further evaluating their landings level, they met the requirement. All three jurisdictions that fell short indicated that the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 prevented them from collecting the full samples. As restrictions remain in place for many states, currently in 2021 in response to the pandemic, there's a strong chance that some states may not be able to meet their 2021 sampling requirements. That being said, all other jurisdictions met the biological monitoring requirements in 2020. I'll, I'll note at this point that the PRT uh, has continued to discuss whether a sufficient number of samples are being collected from different gear types and regions and whether additional sampling should be collected from other gear types. The 2019, um, oh, sorry, I'll move on to the next slide. So uh, in terms of de minimis uh, qualifications to be eligible for de minimis status, a state's bait landings must be less than 1% of the total coastwide bait landings for the two most recent years. The states of Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida requested and qualify for de minimis status for the 2021 fishing season. Next slide. So moving on to other PRT comments and recommendations. So while I noted on the a previous slide, the PRT's comments on the biological sampling, um, I'll say that the PRT's recommendation is that this requirement be evaluated as part of the next management action or during the next benchmark stock assessment. Um, in consulting with members of the stock assessment subcommittee, uh, they noted that in instances where the full samples can't be obtained from the directed fishery, um, it's possible to substitute in ages from fishery independent um, surveys in the region, uh, but in terms of lengths that, that really needs to come from those fishery uh, dependent sources. Moving on to catch and effort uh, requirements for the pound net fishery, the PRT noted concern regarding how this is being collected in North Carolina. So amendment three requires that amendment, at a minimum, each state with a pound net fishery must collect catch and effort elements such as total pounds landed per day, number of pound nets fish per day. In May of 2013, the board approved North Carolina's request to omit this information on the basis that it did not have the current reporting structure to require a quantity of gear field by harvesters or dealers. In recent years, North Carolina Division of Marine Fishery staff have worked to develop a proxy method to estimate effort but this approach likely would not work for developing an adult CPUE index. Um, I'll note that as part of this ongoing dialogue with North Carolina DMF staff, um, included in supplemental materials was a memo that outlines how they have worked to uh, try to provide this information with a proxy approach. Uh, Chris Savage, I believe, is in attendance today, and he can speak to this in greater detail detail after I'm done with my presentation if people have additional uh, questions. But the PRT seeks clarification from the board whether this exemption remains in place for North Carolina. All other states with a pound net fishery met this requirement. Next slide. So I'll go through this briefly as it'll be covered in greater detail in the next agenda item, but landings data suggests that uh, Menhaden have been increasingly available in the Gulf of Maine 
in recent years. So really looking at 2016 through 2020. In 2020, the state of Maine reported landings in excess of 25 million pounds, marking a 13% increase relative to 2019 landings and a 316% increase relative to 2016. In 2020, Massachusetts reported about 8.8 .8 million pounds, marking a 26% increase relative to 2019. And while New Hampshire's 2018 and 2020 landings are confidential, um, I'll note that in 2019, the states of Maine through Massachusetts accounted for nearly 7% of the coastwide total landings. Uh, so Maine has requested additional quota through in-season transfers each year since 2016. Both New Hampshire and Massachusetts have also received additional quota through transfers in 2020. And as noted earlier, Maine and Massachusetts were the only two states to opt into the episodic set-aside fishery last year. Um, and for Maine, that marks four consecutive years of participation in that program. Um, in both states, Maine and Massachusetts reported incidental catch landings in 2020. Next slide. So as part of that, I'll also note that um, the driver that seems to be really uh, pushing this is a reduction in the quota of Atlantic herring. Um, for the incidental catch fishery, landings in 2020 increased to 13.7 uh, million pounds, which is a 30% increase from 2019 and a new time series high. The 2020 uh, incidental catch was approximately 10% of the bait fishery landings. So 2019 and 2020 were the highest levels of incidental catch since the Provision was implemented through um, Amendment 2 in 2013. Current landings may not reflect the original intent of the provision. And as noted in previous FMP reviews, uh, state management of quota has at times created instances when a state moves to the incidental catch fishery prior to the state's quota having been met. So the PRT requested the board consider two things. First, addressing whether the provisions of the incidental catch program uh, need to be revisited or adjusted in the next management document. And the second is in the meantime, provide guidance on how to evaluate the incidental catch program annually moving forward. So for the board's consideration today, um, as noted, we're looking to get some guidance the PRT level regarding how to evaluate the incidental catch provisions annually, um, provide guidance on the North Carolina pound net data collection, and then in terms of uh, items that would require uh, motions, approval, or consider approval of the FMP review and state compliance, as well as de minimis requests. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kirby. Uh, are there questions for Kirby about his report? Uh, after those, if there are questions after that, uh, I'd like to deal with each one of these PRT comments and recommendations in order uh, so that we can we can make some decisions there to help guide our PRT. Any questions? So raise your hand, please. Uh, John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Kirby. Can you just give us a little more background on the uh, the fleet that's actually catching all these incidental catch menhaden up in the Gulf of Maine? How many boats are we looking at? I gather from the report these are mostly purse seiners, and it seems like there must be a lot of fishing power up there since there were over 3,000 trips you reported that reported incidental catch of menhaden, uh, which can't be more than those are six thousand or twelve thousand pounds per trip. Thanks, Kirby. Yeah, so um, I can't get into too much of the specifics for the uh, the variety of different um, gear types uh, because we move into it, at least assigning a value for the state regarding them because that would start to compromise confidentiality. Um, but 
I, I would say the overwhelming uh, majority of those landings um, in, in the incidental catch um, category for Maine are from the per seine fishery. Um, the, the next after that um, is in their anchored uh, or state gillnet um, gear type, but those are uh, vastly different in terms of the quantity. And um, to that end, I, you know, I could turn it to Megan and she may be able to provide more context or information um, for the state of Maine. Megan, I saw your hand was up and now I don't see it again. Were you gonna to respond to John's inquiry? Sure, yeah, I was just uh, offering to help Kirby out. Um, yeah, it is primarily per seine. Uh, I think maybe roughly, I'll say 90% of what we're landing under that provision is per seine. And then as Kirby mentioned, it's skill net. Um, to, I think maybe talk about some of the other comments I've heard. Um, to be clear, we are not opening up the incidental small scale fishery before our quota is met. We are doing that after our quota is met. And I'll note it's it's called the incidental and small scale catch <laughs> fishery provision. So I think we are landing more under the small scale fishery part of that. There are specific gear types that are defined in Amendment 3 for the small scale fishery. So it's uh, approved gear types under that list that are participating. But I, I agree, John, this is um, there's a fair bit of effort and or a lot of effort and uh, they're able to a lot land a lot even at 6,000 pounds and that's primarily because we moved through our, through our quota so quickly that we end up sitting in this provision for uh, most of July on. So I think this kind of gets into our next agenda item, but that that's some, hopefully answer some of your questions. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Megan. Um, uh, just a quick follow-up. Okay. I'm just curious as to uh, whether a 6,000 pound limit, are these uh, boats that are targeting these, these purse seiners is that a full load or is that just a small load? Are they catching other things when they're catching these incidental catch of, of bunker? Thanks. Yeah, no problem. But uh, sorry, Chair, if I can respond to that. Go, go ahead, Megan. Okay, thank you. No, they are targeting Menhaden when they do this. Um, it is 6,000 pounds that they land per day. So we don't allow for that 12,000 pound option. Um, so their load would be 6,000 pounds. We do have um, a spread of landings between the zero and the 6,000 pounds in the small scale fishery. So we have a bit of a peak between the one and 1,000 pound range, and then a larger peak, I would say, between the 5,000 and 6,000 pound range. All right, thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, uh, let's see, Lynn, I saw your hand up, and then Nicola, back to Lynn. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think this conversation is going to morph. It's going to, it's tangled up with the next conversation that we're going to have. But in terms of the annual, I agree that um, there should be some annual evaluation um, of the bycatch um, provision. I, I do just want to say up front, though, that, you know, when this thing began way back with Amendment 2, it was really um, the spirit of it was for these stationary gears, you know, like pound nets that are non-selective. They can't move. They can't chase fish. They have to wait for the fish to come to them. Um, and when you look at the trajectory of how it's been working in Maryland, it's working as it should. So when we have years when slugs come in, we use a little bit of it. But when we don't, we don't. And I just, it's a lifesaver both for the fishery and administratively in Maryland. Um, and so I, I think we, we really need to figure out a way to evaluate it annually, but I also think we need to figure out a way to evaluate how this thing is implemented in its entirety, what's in the spirit of it, and that should be part of the next conversation. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to comment as another state uh, in the Gulf of Maine with some incidental catch landings last year. It was actually our first year in Massachusetts to have incidental catch landings. Um, 
and really it's a, you know, for Massachusetts, it was several magnitudes smaller that, than Maine's, it just at around 50,000 pounds. Um, and it's interesting because in prior years, Massachusetts has had um, the last 5% of its quota set aside for a 6,000 pound limit. So we essentially closed, you know, the large scale directed fishery at a 95% limit in order not to use the incidental allowance um, very heavily. Um, yet we found that that prevented us from ever reaching our quota and and then having the ability to get into the, the episodic event set aside fishery. So that was kind of a, a consequence of, of our doing that, that we, you know, hadn't necessarily um, foreseen. Um, but with regards to the, the landings that we did have last year, since then we have adopted a um, maximum per seine limit that is smaller than what the FMP allows for the small scale fishery. So um, in order to, you know, hopefully right size the gear to the, the trip limit that is available under that provision. Um, but I think, you know, we have somewhat minimal use of the incidental provision right now, but there is, you know, potential for it to to grow, um, not to the level of Maine, I don't think, but, but there is prevent, uh, potential for that. Thanks. Thank you, Nicola. That's, that's very helpful. Any other questions uh, for Kirby? Um, if not, Kirby, I think, um, uh, why don't we try to dispense with the PRT recommendations and then we'll circle back around and see if we can get a motion to uh, approve the items. So, uh, first, um, First issue, and maybe we could bring the slide back up, is concern about uh, the biosampling. Uh, obviously, 2020 was an extraordinary year, uh, and it lingers into 2021. I think we certainly need to be cautious about using probably either of these years as a, as a barometer of normality. So, but the, the question I've got for the board uh, is, uh, is this of sufficient concern to warrant some sort of action as relates to compliance, or do we want to uh, recommend to the PRT that uh, they come back to the board after the next assessment uh, and revisit the sampling levels and give us some guidance, and then we could possibly incorporate those in a, in a future management document. So is there, uh, if you've got comments, concerns, please let me know. Right, Megan, go ahead. Thank you. I just kind of wanted to speak to, I see, you know, the bullet point here, Maine fell short in 2020. I think our requirement was 38 samples and we got 37. So um, I am admitting and recognizing that we were one short, but uh, admittedly, uh, I'm actually quite proud of our sampling team for the effort that they put in during a pandemic. It was only a few years ago when we were required six samples. So to be able to scale up so quickly to 37 samples, um, I have to give kudos to that team. So not trying to make excuses, just trying to provide some context. Thank you, Megan. Uh, anyone else? Uh, if I don't hear anything to the contrary, uh, I think we should consider advising the PRT to maybe hit the pause button on this issue of concern until the next benchmark assessment. Uh, and then come back to us and uh, give us some guidance that we may need to consider for incorporating into to future management. So is anyone uncomfortable with that approach? If so please let me know. Uh, Tom Foti. Yeah, I just was curious about where North Carolina does not collect the data. Are they going to actually start collecting the data from their pound net fishery? Yeah, we'll uh, we'll get to that one next, uh, and I'm gonna call on Chris Bat Savage to give us a little context for that. Uh, uh, so if, if if everyone's fine with that approach for biological sampling, then that's what we'll be going forward. Uh, is that I don't see any not hearing any opposition, Nicola? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess I, I thought there was two different issues with biological sampling, and I'm not sure if I'm just um, 
misinterpreting what you're saying wrong or not. Um, so there were, there was two two issues, right, where Maine Mass and PRFC fell short in 2020, and I think it's understandable that there were challenges with sampling last year, and that um, we can. Um, you know, say those states did the best that they could in the year and, and move on. However, I think the PRT was also commenting that they weren't sure that the the formula by which we determine each state's level of sampling, if that is adequate, and it was recommended that that be addressed in the next management action. So that that part of it, I think, you know, could be part of our next agenda item as well. Yes, that's correct. I, I did not get a sense that anyone was wanting to uh, find uh, Maine, Massachusetts, or PRFC out of compliance on uh, based on the lack of biological sampling. So, uh, if someone feels differently, please let me know. And the other was obviously the as you as you described it, uh, the magnitude of the sampling, and, and is that uh, consistent with providing the best scientific information available uh, for our decisions? So. Um, okay, hopefully that's clear. Now the uh, kitchen effort data uh, from the pound net fishery. Um, obviously there was some uh, background document in the briefing materials and uh, uh, Chris, Matt Savage, could I call on you to just to give a little context and explain this uh, for folks? Yeah, thanks Mr. Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I've got you loud and clear, Chris. Okay, great, thanks. So, uh, so yeah, I appreciate the the opportunity to do that. Um, as as the, the the board is aware, we've uh, using a proxy to uh, you know, meet this requirement of the the FMP, where you know we our uh, our trip ticket uh, program doesn't collect uh, information on pound net landings to the level uh, that's required in, in Amendment Three. So we come up with a of a, an alternate way to do it. We've been doing this for a few years, but it, it doesn't really get to the, the, the level of getting that, that CPUE data. Uh, in order to get that, uh, if my understanding is correct, we would need to uh, either add add a, a new permit for the, the pound net fishery uh, collecting or that's catching menhaden you know, to get this information or add it on to the existing pound net permits that we have you know, for people just to you know, have have these, you know, allow, allow them to set the, uh, the, the gear in the water um, wh wh where they do. Uh, but both both are, are not, are not um, light loads, really, when you can't kind of consider the other uh, things that we, we have as far as monitoring and all. Um, and I guess to just put it in perspective, uh, you know, although we're not meeting the, the requirements of Amendment 3, the the North Carolina pound net fishery is pretty small in terms of, you know, landings, Manhattan, Manhattan landings overall. I think last year we landed about 115,000 pounds of Manhattan uh, from pound nets, and it's been pretty consistent in that 100 to 150,000 pound uh, level for, for a few years. So it's not very, not a very big fishery. Uh, and, you know, again, with, with pound nets, uh, it, it's a matter of scale in terms of just the size of the nets. In other words, a, you know, a, a pound net in Core Sound is, is quite a bit smaller than one in the northern part of the state in Albemarle Sound. So, um, you know, there's maybe some comparability issues in terms of uh, CPUEs, not only for our state, but comparative to other states. So, I just wanted to give a little bit of background, some explanation, and some context, I guess, as far as what our, how our fishery operates, some of the challenges we have in, in meeting you know, the, the full suite of recommendations and uh, and just uh, see if the board has any questions or what their thoughts are on us moving forward. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Uh, any any questions for, for Chris uh, with regard to his comments? Any concerns, you know, this, we, we as a board have, have been exempting North Carolina uh, and uh, approving their proxy method um obviously it doesn't necessarily meet all the absolute requirements but uh, I, I believe i'm correct that the uh the cpue index hasn't really been a vital part of the assessment anyway so while it's certainly desirable to have the most precise data we can have it's not limiting the quality of the assessment uh, as i understand it and certainly someone can correct me if 
if I'm wrong there. But uh, are there any concerns with uh, with staying the course with regard to to uh, North Carolina's proxy method? Uh, they're estimating CPUE in their planet fishery. Uh, if so, please raise your hand and be recognized. Don't see anyone. So with that, I think we can give guidance back to PRT that certainly appreciate and understand their their concern, uh, but maybe also hit the pause button on this one until uh, maybe the next benchmark assessment uh, when it may be shown that uh, data of this type may actually be more integral and important than we, we think. So uh, third item, um, and if you'll go to, I guess, to the next slide there, uh, is the concerns about incidental catch and the provisions thereof. Um, One more slide this over. Certainly, uh, uh, this is something I think that's obviously piqued everyone's interest, and uh, we can certainly move comments and discussions about this into our next agenda item, but I uh, only want to give even one chance to. Uh, to address it now if they want to. If not, we'll uh, we can certainly talk about it in our next agenda item. I don't, don't see any hands up. So uh, yes, bud, we'll just to help with framing yes. it. Um, this is Kirby. Uh, you know, I think the PRT is really trying to to flag if there is any specific guidance the board wants to give the PRT in evaluating how states currently operate their state quota management using incidental catch. If there isn't any consensus or board guidance on that, you know, then the other component of incidental catch, the fact that it's increased and whether the board wants to overall change that program or adjust it in a future management document, that can be taken up in our next agenda item. But at this stage, if there's we're really looking for any guidance for the PRT and how to look at how states are either opting into incidental catch or not based on how they manage their quota. Thanks, Kirby, for, for uh, clarifying that. And I see uh, Joe Samino, you've got your hand up. Yes, Mr. Chair, thanks. Uh, New Jersey is one of the states that has gear specific allocations. And as such, um, it certainly is easier for us to move specific gears that have have taken their quota over to incidental and you know you can see from those tables that has been performing as we expect the incidental catch to perform um, while still allowing other gear types to remain in their directed fisheries you know i think i think that option that idea does go towards uh, what incidental catch was meant to be, you know, as opposed to leaving those gear types closed until all harvest has happened, in which case that could be very challenging for us because we're usually seeking to keep that fishery going. And with the way quota transfers have been happening in, in recent years, when we get close, quota has been available. So my hope would be that we can clear it up that 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 remains a possibility. I think it's within the concept of incidental catch. I think this obviously is something we need to keep an eye on as we go forward, but it doesn't count against the overall quota. So I don't think a state should be required to catch their entire quota just to shift into incidental. Um, and then, I, as I said, we will be getting to, is the incidental catch happening as it should as a whole? Thank you. Thank you, Joe. All right, anyone else at this point? Uh, are we getting the information we need in the way we need it uh, to evaluate uh, the efficacy of the incidental catch provisions to make sure they're working as we intend them to do? Uh, if not, uh, I need guidance from the board on what we do need uh, to better assess it. We're getting what we need, that's fine. Don't see any hands up. Okay. Again, you know, this is certainly not the end all be all. We can circle back around to this. All right, at that, this point, I would certainly entertain a motion 
to approve the FMP review, the state compliance reports, and the de minimis request if someone is willing to offer that uh, and raise their hand. Uh, I see Emerson Hasbrook. I assume is that a question or a motion? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm willing to make that motion. All right. Uh, proceed. Um, the staff have, have that motion prepared. Yep, it's uh, displayed. Yeah, so I move to approve the FMP review for the 2020 fishing year, state compliance reports, and de minimis requests from Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And I see a whole lot of hands up. I assume in a second. I think the first one of those was Malcolm Rhodes. Is that correct, Dr. Rhodes? Are you seconding that motion? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you very much. All right, so we have a motion uh, for consideration. Any further discussion on the motion? Any opposition to the motion? If so, <laughs> please raise your hand. I don't see any, so we'll consider the motion accepted unanimously. Thank you all very much, and thank you, Kirby. So we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is to discuss revisiting the commercial quota provisions of Amendment 3. So, Kirby, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll just give Maya a second to get the other presentation up on the screen. Excellent. Quick, I'm All right, so your mic is still open. Sorry, Kirby. Emerson, your mic is still open. If you can mute yourself, so yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so next, I have a presentation on recent Menhaden quota landings, and uh, a memo for this with this information was included in the briefing materials. So as we've talked about at the last board meeting and earlier today, uh, that Amendment 3 is, is really the management document that establishes how the, the, the current management regime operates. It established the current quota allocations to manage the total allowable catch. Each jurisdiction is allocated a 0.5% fixed minimum quota, and the remainder of that TAC is allocated based on a three-year average of landings from 2009 through 2011. Annually, jurisdictions have the option to relinquish their fixed minimum quota by December 1st of the preceding fishing year and any quota relinquished by a jurisdiction is redistributed to other jurisdictions uh, based on landings data from 20 or 2009 through 2011. Any overage of a quota allocation is determined based on final allocations and the overage amount is subtracted uh, from that jurisdiction's quota um, in the subsequent year on a pound for pound basis. So as a reminder, outlined in the amendment is the allocations that are to be revisited at least every three years following implementation. So that is why we are going through recent landings and uh, quota performance today. What I'll be presenting on uh, that was included in the memo are relinquished quota from 2018 through 2021, um, jurisdictions total landings as a percentage of the coastwide from 2016 through 2020, incidental catch from 2017 through 2020, and the episodic set-aside landings from 2018 through 2020. All right, so first, next slide, going on to relinquish quota under Amendment 3. As mentioned, uh, jurisdictions have the option to relinquish part or all of their fixed minimum quota by December 1st of the preceding fishing year. So what this table shows you is that only three states have relinquished quota from 2018 through 2021. Delaware, South Carolina, and Georgia. Delaware is the only state that relinquished quota every year during this time, averaging 1.9 million pounds annually. Georgia relinquished its full quota, 2.35 million pounds annually from 2018 through 2020. Okay, so next is quota transfers. Next slide. 
this was asked to be brought up again, um, and I just want to make sure that the board is aware of what this is showing. You know, so this is showing quoted transfers from 2018 through 2020. The gray cells um, are jurisdictions that received quota. Uh, as noted before, not every jurisdiction uh, transfers quota consistently. Only Maine, Connecticut, New York, Maryland, and Florida either gave or received quota every year from 2018 through 2020. Those states are bolded. And for all three years, the only jurisdictions that have a net increase in quota through transfers remain New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Move on to the next slide. All right, so um, this is a table that was presented to the board back in February, and it's just been updated with what the landings as a percentage of the coastwide total is for 2020. Um, so the key thing to note here is relative to what was presented before, um, you could see that for Maine, Massachusetts, and New Jersey, their percentage of the coastwide landings total increased in 2020 relative to 2019. Um, I'll also note that while uh, there are states that have no value included in their cell, it doesn't mean that they didn't have landings. It's just based on landing 1% uh, or excuse me, 0.1% of the uh, coastwide total uh, that didn't register. Uh, additionally, New Hampshire's uh, landings in 2020 were confidential, but uh, they I can indicate that they landed more than what their initial allocation was um, in 2020. When I get done with the presentation, I know that uh, New Hampshire commissioners may want to speak uh, in greater detail to uh, how their landings have changed over time. Next slide. Okay, so as we talked about in the FMP review, uh, the bycatch allowance was first implemented under Amendment 2 in 2013. It was modified by Addendum 1 to Amendment 2, and it's continued under Amendment 3. <clears throat> And as outlined in Amendment 3, after a jurisdiction's allocation is met and its directed fishery is closed, Menhaden landings can continue to occur as incidental catch under specific gear types. So there's small scale gear types, cast nets, traps, pots, haul seines, fike nets, hook and line, bag nets, hoop nets, hand lines, trammel nets, bait nets, and purse seines, which are smaller than 150 fathom long and 8 fathom deep and then non-directed gears, which include pound nets, anchored slash stake gill nets, drift gill nets, trawls, fishing uh, weirs, bike nets, and floating fish traps. And these gear types may land up to 6,000 pounds of menhaden per trip per day. So over the last three years, a total of 10 different jurisdictions have had incidental catch landings. Seven jurisdictions reported incidental catch in a year in 2017 and only one in 2019. The annual coastwide total incidental catch ranged from approximately 3.3 million pounds to 13.9 million pounds. And it was not related to the number of states reporting incidental catch landings. A majority of the incidental catch landings occur on trips that land either 1,000 pounds or less. So about 37% of those uh, trips allowed land 1,000 pounds or less, or between 5,000 and 6,000 pounds, 34%. And the majority of the incidental landings have been caught by Persane, with the next uh, gear type being fixed uh, gill nets. The share of incidental catch landings using Persane gear has increased from 57% in 2017 to approximately 88% in 2019 and 2020. So from 2019 to 20 or 2018 to 2019, incidental catch increased from by about 225%, with Maine being the only state with an incidental catch that year. 
from 2019 to 2020, as noted in the FMP review, incidental catch increased again. And this time it included four states, Maine, Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey. Next slide. Uh, so the episodic set-aside program was another requested item to, to be in the memo. So as the board is aware, this program was first implemented under Amendment 2 in 2013 and modified through a technical addendum later that year. Amendment 3 made no changes to the program. Just as a reminder of how this works, annually 1% of the TAC is set aside for episodic events, which are defined as any instance in which a qualified state has reached its quota allocation prior to September 1. And the state can prove the presence of an, unusual, an unusually large amount of Menhaden in state waters. To demonstrate a large amount of Menhaden in their state waters, a state can use either surveys, whether they're aerial or sane, to indicate high biomass, recent landings information, or informa information highlighting the potential for a fish kill, uh, associated human health concerns that would arise from not addressing this and that harvest would reduce or eliminate that fish kill. So the goal of the program is to add flexibility to menhaden management to allow harvest during an episodic event to help reduce discards and prevent fish kills. It's important to note that only the states of Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New York are currently eligible to opt in annually. And I'll note that um, one of the challenges that we do run into is that in evaluating this program annually, you're going off of landings that are being reported by the state in real time. And so there can be at times differences between what is reported as the in-season you know, final total that they give and then what the finalized landings value that they offer at when compliance reports are due in the subsequent year. And this just is, is a byproduct of preliminary data um, that is being used to monitor the, the set-aside program. So for, next slide please. For the board's uh, consideration today, uh, what I'm putting out is whether reallocation is something that the board wishes to uh, pursue. And if so, uh, that, that that is understood, it can be completed through an addendum. Um, from a staff standpoint, it would be helpful that if an addendum is to be initiated, that the purpose and scope of that addendum um, is, is made clear. Um, reallocation ideas or options can be helpful but they should ultimately be linked to what the, the overall purpose of the action is. Uh, it's a way to help check to ensure that what, what the board is seeking to address um, is then providing guidance to the, what would likely be a plan development team to develop these options to, that meet that need. And then if there are other specific provisions that the board wishes this addendum or management action to address, such as quota transfers, incidental catch, or the episodic set aside in the fishery management plan, that those be made clear in the motion. I will note that confidentiality, as noted in February, uh, will pose some challenges for how this landings data can be displayed in, a, in any type of management document. Next slide. So for the board's consideration today, uh, possible board action is whether to consider initiating a management document on reallocation. And if the board would like to pursue that, then a plan development team would need to be populated. Um, it doesn't have to be today. States would be able to follow up with me afterwards. We do have parameters around how many people we have on a, a plan development team or PDT and I can provide more information to that in a follow-up email to the board. But it's important to note at this point that a PDT would need, PDT members would need to obtain confidential data access. Um, given this is a coastwide management board, that would be for all states, Maine through Florida. Um, and as part of what could be a management document, 
uh, ACCSP has been working to pull together landings data from 1985 and through 2020. They have indicated that that will be available later this month, validated. Um, so that type of information could be available for a management document and developing options. But again, confidentiality may pose challenges for how that information can be broken out and presented to both the board and the public uh, for consideration in, in developing options that meet the board's needs. So lastly, I'll just hit home again that clarity on the purpose and the scope of what the board hopes to achieve um, in any type of management action uh, will help us from a and a plan to employ in developing a document in a timely manner. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kirby. Uh, appreciate that presentation. Did a good job of, of summing up where we're at. And um, I'll uh, open it up. Any more questions? I see Rich White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, clarify uh, New Hampshire's landing situation and um, <clears throat> the harvesters uh, that did land uh, provided me with landing data and authorized me to use that uh, in, in this setting. I'm not going to quote actual poundage, but I'm going to give a, even though I could, um, <clears throat> I'll give a sense of what New Hampshire landed uh, this year. And I just want to clarify this did not come from the department, <clears throat> that it was from the harvesters directly. And um, New Hampshire land or harvested about uh, just under five million pounds last year. And uh, if it weren't for issues uh, in one of the vessels that was going to continue to fish, um that in all likelihood we would have had another million pounds uh landed so just just wanted to clarify where that <clears throat> where that landed um so when we do get in to hopefully get into looking at any changes in quotas that that you know the actual number can be used thank you thank you richie i appreciate that that's that's very helpful so any other i uh, see lynn you got your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I admit we have a power outage here, so I, I can't see what I usually see in terms of materials. But as I remember, both um, South Carolina and Georgia um, stopped relinquishing their base allocation as we, you know, move in more recent years. But I think that South Carolina. Um, transferred some quota later in a year when they didn't relinquish. And what I'm trying to understand is, you know, if there's four numbers from this state that so can speak to this a little bit, I'm, I'm trying to understand why, what their rationale is for um, not relinquishing. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll uh, not put anybody on the hot seat, but sounds like that's a question for for Mel and for uh, for Doug. So Mel, I see your hand up. Mel, can't hear you. How about now? That's, that's loud and clear now. Oh, okay. Helps if you press the right button. Um, yeah, so I don't, as far as like when we may have relinquished in the past, uh, as far as it's before my time, but I, I know we hadn't relinquished. Uh, and, and Lynn's right, in 19 and 20, we did uh, transfer. Uh, and that might be in part uh, due to um, just the, the need. I mean, we were asked, there was a need. Um, you know, I was on board at that point. I think Robert had already. Uh, shifted off so um, we were just felt like we were responding to a to re specific requests from states that were you know kind of in a bind and and trying to help out but in terms of why we've never uh, relinquished not sure other than we just might want to make sure we have 
uh, something there in the event that at some point in the future uh, there is a potential for a fishery. Uh, so it's sort of like not surrendering um, our, our options there. Uh, but yes, indeed, we did we did transfer some in 19 and 20, but haven't relinquished. So that's a, a fair assessment of where we are. All right, thank you, Mel. Uh, Doug, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, the proverbial hot seat. So, Lynn, quite honestly, we look back at how the relinquished quota had been divvied up, uh, you know, based on the previous reference point, and I felt like that maybe the majority of of what we were relinquishing didn't need to go to the to the reduction fishery and felt like that it was probably best used if another state in the bait fishery were to ask for it. So in 2021, this year I have not relinquished it and I'm waiting on a, a New England state to ask for a transfer of quota rather than putting it into the uh, overall pool. Thank you, Doug. Um, Lynn, you're out of any follow up on that or you? No, thank you. Thank you so much. That 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 helps. I I very much appreciate um, the responses. All right, thank you. All right, any other questions for Kirby about his presentation? If not, uh, just sort of the again to to reset our context. You know, a review does not require a reaffirmation of existing allocation or does not require a change. However, if the board feels that status quo is not accomplishing the goals and objectives of the, of the allocation scheme, then it is certainly incumbent upon any member of the board to offer uh, a motion to start a management action to revisit allocation and to offer options. And so uh, at this point, I open the floor up and I see Megan, you have your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, well, I'll take you up on the offer. I have a motion. And I believe staff has that uh, ready to go. So um, I can read this in and then if I get a second, I will provide some rationale. Move yeah, go ahead. To Oh, thank you. Uh, move to initiate an addendum to consider changes to the allocation of the commercial tax. The goals of this action are to better align jurisdictions commercial quotas with current landings and fish, avail fish availability while providing a level of access to the fishery by all Atlantic Coast jurisdictions and to reduce the need for quota transfers. In addition to status quo, explore and analyze changes to the allocation timeframe, including options based on more recent years of landings, landings data, example average or best over the last three or four years, and an option with 50% based on these more recent years of landings data and 50% based on status quo of 2009 to 2011 landing basis. Also consider in these new timeframes options to reduce the fixed minimum, e.g. 0.25% in addition to the status quo of 0.5% fixed minimum. Changes to the episodic set aside up to 5%. All right, thank you, Megan. Uh, we have a second, I see uh, Ricky White. Is that a second, Ricky? Uh, yes, it is, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much. We have a motion and we have a second. So with that, I'll open up the floor for uh, discussion about the motion. So if you have questions of the maker, uh, comments, uh, please uh, signify by raising your hand. Mr. Chair, this is Megan. Could I provide some rationale if that's okay? Please do. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so obviously at the last board meeting, I talked about some of the challenges that Maine has been facing given kind of the level of quota we're allocated versus the exponential increase in the fish we're seeing. And as a result of this, we've become completely reliant on things like quota transfers and the small scale fishery. And I think that's what we're seeing in those FMP review numbers. Um, you know, while these flexibilities in Amendment 3 have held Maine over in the short term, I, I don't think these are long term solutions. 
Um, obviously, there's a fair bit of focus on means small scale landings, um, but this is a symptom, I believe, of the mismatch between means fish and versus our quota. Uh, we're kind of getting squeezed into this provision of the amendment and we end up sitting in that small scale fishery for about four months and that's how we accumulate such high landings. Um, I am proposing an addendum at this point. Um, as Kirby mentioned, Amendment 3 does allow us to change allocations via an addendum. And during the Amendment 3 process, there was really extensive discussion amongst the board members and members of the public regarding a range of quota allocation methods. And as a result, I don't see a clear need for coastwide scoping on allocation just a few years later. Everything that is included in my motion in terms of things for the PDT to explore is already an element in our amendment. I've also tried to provide some ideas for the PDT to explore. However, you know, I'll note that there's always latitude for the PDT to investigate other options as they see fit. I will also note that just like any other addendum, if the board uh, wants or the board will get an opportunity to review the draft at a subsequent board meeting. And if we want, we can always make changes to that draft or add options and send it back for further PDT work. So um, there are opportunities abound for the board to kind of develop this through an addendum. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, I would assume that it would uh, certainly be Maine's uh, uh, interest in having this uh, be effective for the next fishing year, if at all possible. Is that correct? I think, um, you know, it's, mo it's more important at this point to make sure that everyone is on board with this document. So if that means taking two meetings to develop the addendum, then I think that needs to be the priority. If it only takes one and we can do this by next year, that's great. All right, thank you. All right, uh, let's see here. I'll, uh, I'll take these as I read them from top down. So if I'm skipping over folks, I apologize, but I've got a pretty long list here. So uh, I'm gonna start with Justin Davis and then Doug Hamans will be next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I note that this motion doesn't include a consideration of the incidental landing provision. And we had some discussion earlier uh, at this meeting about sort of how potentially the use or intent of that provision has shifted from maybe what it was originally. Uh, I think I'd like to hear some more discussion around the table about that topic, but I think at this point I, I would be leaning towards uh, offering an uh, amendment to the motion to add that in um, to the agenda, but I, I guess I'm not ready to do that at this point, and I'd like to hear more discussion on the topic, hopefully as we go around the table. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, Kirby, just uh, a, a point of clarification to make sure we don't get uh, derailed here. If we were to explore changes in the incidental catch provision, is that still within the scope of the addendum process? That's my understanding. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, Doug Hamas is next and then Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to make sure I understand uh, the need for the reduction of those states that have a half percent down to a quarter. If I look at Table 8, which was in Kirby's presentation, it looks like to me there's a, roughly 11 million pounds that was transferred in 2020 from most of the states uh, in the, on, the, on the board. Uh, and only three of those states are affected by the reduction from fifth, from 0.5 to a quarter. And of those three, I mean, that's, that's a change of 3 million pounds. So I guess I would ask what the need is to affect those three states when it's less than a third of what was transferred in 2020. Okay, thank you. Megan, would you like to respond to that? Please? Sure. Was that Doug? I, I'm sorry, I don't know who was speaking there. Um, yeah, I can yeah, look at. Doug Hamlin. Okay, thank you. Doug, I can look at the table um, that you were referencing, but I've included that because, um, quite frankly, there are a number of states who are, who have a 0.5% fixed minimum allocation who are not 
uh, whose landings are are under that amount. Um, so I'm trying to put forward a variety of options to see what the numbers come out as and, and kind of give the PDT some tools to work with to see what shakes out. And if we come back in the next board meeting and that's not an option that's favorable for the board, then we can take it out. But again, just trying to provide some latitude for the PDT to explore different options. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, next, I'm Rich White and then uh, Roy Miller. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my second is uh, clearly to get an addendum moving forward. Um, whether this is the final layout of the addendum, um, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, that, that there aren't other alternatives that could be added into this and that this couldn't be tweaked um, if needed once we see what this does to, you know, each state. <clears throat> but the need for this is clear in New England. Um, four or five years ago, New Hampshire had no landings at all, and now we're five, six million pounds a year, and may go up substantially this year if we can, we have, we have additional vessels moving in uh, to the fishery, uh, supposedly. Um, and the herring, Atlantic herring quota uh, is so low that there's a number of large vessels that said that, that, that they're not even gonna enter the fishery this year to fish for it because it's not economic. <clears throat> so that shows you the need for bait for the billion dollar New England lobster uh, fishery. So <clears throat> it's kind of a perfect storm of uh, the loss of herring, the need for this large amount of bait and the availability uh, of Manhattan, you know, in a stock that, that is doing well. So, um, so I think it's critical that we go forward with this addendum um, I guess I would say less to focus on the exact details of it and uh, add additional ideas for the PDT to work on and bring back to us uh, at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Richie. And, and again, that's, uh, we'll reiterate what you heard from Kirby is, is that the more specificity we can give the PRT, on the options that we want to analyze, the, the greater likelihood that we'll be able to have what we need to ultimately make a decision when we get to that point. So, uh, Roy Miller and Nicola, you're on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would uh, like to ask a question of Megan, and then I have a short comment. Um, but as a follow-up to Richie White's remarks, I, I'm assuming that um, Maine's incidental catch landings in recent years are a reflection of the stock of the Menhaden that are in um, Maine waters. Um, what I'm wondering is how much of it is due to um, the bait fleet not being able to capture enough Atlantic herring and switching over to Menhaden, or is it strictly increased abundance of Menhaden due to climate change or, or other effects? So that's the first question I have for Megan. All right, Megan, would you uh, please respond to Roy's question? Yeah, thanks, Roy, for the question. Um, so I think herring is part of the story, but I, I guess I disagree with um, kind of what was put in the FMP review that it's the primary driver. Um, we have a vessel size limit for the Menhaden fishery. So many of the herring vessels that we have in Maine don't actually qualify or can't participate in the Menhaden fishery. Um, so we are not seeing like a, a direct transfer of herring boats switching over to Menhaden. I think it's actually much more complex um, where we're seeing a change in, in almost the bait infrastructure in Maine from um, kind of these uh, bait dealers, I'll say, that were predominantly herring to almost wharf specific bait sourcing through Menhaden. Um, so what we're seeing is a lot more small vessels and, and lobstermen going out and catching their own bait. So that is 
it's a very different set of participation, I would say, in the Menhaden and herring fishery. It's it's not a transition. And again, I think it's a more complex story than just not having herring. This is um, wharves going out, seeing an abundant resource and wanting to catch their own bait for their businesses. All right. Thank you, Megan. All right, yeah. back to you, Roy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, just a quick comment. Uh, listening earlier to Lynn Fegley's understanding of what incidental catch, what incidental catch is, uh, why, why that category was created in the first place. It seems to me that the Menhaden incidental landings in Maine don't fit the definition really of an incidental catch because, let's face it, Persane is a directed gear. It, it's not like the fish uh, inadvertently swam into pound nets. So I think we need to change over that incidental catch in Maine to to directed fisheries landings if we're going to deal with this problem. So that's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. All right, Nicola, and then we have Lynn on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, I'd like to speak in favor of initiating an addendum to look at the reallocation and associated provisions. Um, I think that the, the 2009 to 2011 time series that are used as the basis um, reflect a, uh, a time period that the distribution of Manhattan was different from now. Um, and we're seeing that in, in Massachusetts and the, in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and it's a pretty narrow time frame. Um, so it makes sense to me to include some additional um, years, more recent years. And as Megan has addressed, you know, that could go a long way to addressing the issue of the small scale and incidental landings um, that are occurring under that provision. Um, however, I wouldn't be opposed to also including um, potential changes to how that allowance is used um, in this addendum as well. Um, a, a cap as, as uh, Mr. Kalin referenced um, or some other type of um, restriction on the use of it. Um, it in, in Massachusetts, we've, you know, been fortunate to have the, the episodic events set aside as well uh, recently to, to use, um, but I, I'm glad to see that this um, motion also includes looking at a different percentage for that. I think when Amendment 2 was passed, 1% of the quota sounded like a lot, and based on the current distribution of the resource um, in the Northeast, um, 1% can be taken very quickly. Um, so I appreciate Megan including that in her motion as well. Um, and I think another idea that uh, I'd like to address is potentially some type of, and this could go along with, um, you know, reducing the fixed minimum allocation, is, is some type of um, threshold for a state to receive the default minimum, some type of past or expected commercial fishing activity um, to to get that allocation. So thank you. All right, thank you, Nicola. All right, uh, Lynn, and then we've got Dennis Abbott on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if it's okay, I, I, I am, um, very uncomfortable with this motion. And I would actually like to offer a substitute. And then if I get a second, I'd like to speak to it. Uh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, go, go, go ahead. You, certainly you can, you can offer a substitute motion if you choose to. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Nope. We lost sure, what's her. Going on? We oh, lost okay. her. All right. Well, when she gets back, let's move ahead. Uh, Dennis Abbott uh, and then Jim Gilmore had you on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm in full support of Megan's motion. As, and seconded by Richie White. It's, it's very clear that the resources 
I won't say shifted northward, but it is available northward. The very fact that through the incidental catch, many small boats in the state of Maine have been able to go out and catch 13 million pounds surely shows that there's a resource available there. And also, when we initiated the ad amendment and we gave the states the minimum of 0.5%, those figures were very arbitrary. And it's been proven that a number of states that received allocations did not need 0.5%. But I think that was part of our bargain in passing the amendment. So there is a big need for changing it. And there's a has to be a recognition that the New England states and the Gulf of Maine should have access to this resource. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Jim Gilmore, and then I think we have Joe Samino on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just quickly, I, I support the motion. Um, obviously, what we did a few years ago, um, we we based the management back a few years back on assumptions that are probably no longer uh, appropriate, and I think we definitely need a change. In fact, Dennis is right. We we took a, a best guess at some of these things and came up with what we thought was reasonable. Now that we've uh, uh, got more information, plus things that have changed between uh, growth of the uh, stock for Menhaden coupled with a decline in sea herring, uh, we obviously need to reevaluate this. So I'm, uh, we're definitely in support of the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right, Joe Salino, and then Megan, I have your hand back up so you're on deck. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I see I see Lynn is back, so maybe we can do this a little differently. Um, Lynn had, uh, had a chance to text me and uh, I, I shared her concerns. Um, and so there was this thought of a substitute motion. Um, we are going to be at the executive committee and anyone who wants to get up early tomorrow will hear a presentation on a very large subcommittee that's looking at reallocation. So while I appreciate um, Megan's motion for an addendum, I would like to substitute um, in consideration that there is a group working on reallocation in general, and I'm concerned that this is just too narrow of a frame to move forward with. So I would like to move to substitute to initiate an addendum to reconsider Menhaden allocation. I would move that the board create a working group to develop allocation options for review at the August 2021 board meeting. And for those to be presented to the PDT. I also feel that um, the, the incidental take needs to be um, looked at. I think the PDT can do that. So, um, I don't know the exact wording, but I do think that um, the 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 incidental take needs to be reviewed by the plan development team, um, including what gears qualify. Okay, we have uh, a substitute motion for board consideration, and I'm just. Uh, let me editorialize here a little bit because I want to make sure that we're getting the horse and the cart in proper alignment. I assume that there's a second, Lynn, that you would second this motion. I can't hear her. Yes, 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 Mr. Chair, I would second. Thank you. And I would love to speak to it as well at some point. Okay. All right. But before we, we, Enter discussion about this substitute motion, um, and this is, I guess, the question for for Kirby and Tony is: um, Do we need an addendum to create a working group, or if the purpose of the motion is to create a working group to develop allocation options, should the working group, if if it's the will of the board to create a working group, should that working group be created and developed? options and then bring those back to the board for consideration within an addendum so i appreciate some advice on that 
Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I mean, it's the prerogative of the board in the order that you go, but you definitely don't need an addendum to have a work group be formed. Um, it would be good to give that work group some, you know, as we have in our work group guidance document, there needs to be some specific goals and objectives um, for for that work group to to follow. Um, but you don't need to initiate a management document prior to. Okay. All right. Okay. With that said and clarified, I'll uh, I'll open it, open it up for some uh, questions and discussion on this. Uh, uh, Joe, would you like to add any more to your rationale to this, and then I'll call on Lynn after that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the cart before the horse was simply in my wording, and I, I apologize to everyone, including Lynn, for that. But the concept here is to start an addendum process, and that's that's what the substitute motion is doing. Um, the the idea behind the working group going in conjunction with that again, it, it, it speaks to uh, you know the, the hope that we would have a much broader scope and you know and have that at our at our next meeting and and since there is a subcommittee a very large subcommittee that's looking at this we i thought there was there was need for that thanks okay uh lynn would you like to add your comments and then i'm gonna open it up to the folks that have their hands raised yeah thank you mr chair and i really apologize for the technical problems um you know i was just extremely uncomfortable with the motion as it stood, um, allocation, this is such a complex issue. We heard it in the comments um, of board members leading up to the, you know, after the motion was made about the um, minimum base allocation, about the incidental years. Um, I will say that from a Maryland centric um, uh, uh, place that to look at time frames of allocation that are based on more recent years that puts a target squarely on the backs of maryland you know i i, I know i'm i i keep repeating myself but we have a very small limited entry fishery that can't move it is the backbone of our communities they catch uh menhaden for our for our crab, um, for bait, for our crab fishery. And in terms of stock availability, you know, I've been told the last two years that the fish have been in the bay, but the pound nets are all sitting in shoal water. So the fish have just bypassed the pound nets by staying in deeper water. And I honestly can't, you know, I can't uh, rationalize a way that I could stand before our commercial community and tell them that we would be facing quota cuts of up to 60 percent which means we would have been fishing over our quota for the last few years um that's just an, an intractable option um for us and i think there's room here i think there's i, I think with the incidental catch um by catch allowance you know that um works really well for us it's been in place for nine years it hasn't yet caused an issue and i think that would um provide us some flexibility you know to talk about how we might adjust our quotas but i think the states need to sit down and have this conversation not under parliamentary procedures allow the states to go back and make sure they're checked in with their industries um and then come back to the board in august and really provide um the pdt with some some options that doesn't just um some of which would just be tragedy for a state so i you know i feel really strongly about this we you know we can't fast track allocation and i so appreciate megan's you know um you know the 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 sentiment to keep us all at the table but i would really prefer to preload this um and get a work group together to discuss and and i'll um I have a lot to say, but I'm going to stop talking there. Thank you. 
All right, thank you, Lynn. I'm gonna call on Kirby for a point of order regarding the substitute motion. Uh, thanks, Chair Woodward. So I know we're dealing with some uh, connection issues with a few board members and Maya has been doing a great job with, with trying to get these motions down, but uh, reading the substitute motion, I think the second sentence is a little unclear. So I wanna ask the makers of the motion if they could clarify, it says, move the board, create a work group to develop allocation options for review. Is it to be at the August board meeting? And if, if so, we wanna make sure that's in this substitute motion. And then the other point of clarification is that is, is the intent for the work group to develop allocation options that are presented to the board or then presented to the plan development team? And, and I guess I'm trying to better understand what the thought process is for how that moves forward. Uh, Mr. Chair, I could speak to that. Please do. Yeah, so the intent of the motion was to create a work group um, that would develop allocation options for the board to review and discuss at the August 2021 meeting. And then coming out of that meeting, the results of that discussion would go to the PDT to guide the development of a document. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Mr. Chair. Joe, go ahead, Joe. Thank you. The there, uh, yeah, I think August got misplaced, but so did the the concept that the PDT should be looking at um, the incidental catch. I don't, I don't see anything here in this current motion about um, incidental catch. Joe, can you um, just specifically wordsmith for Maya so she knows exactly what you want her to write? So do you want it to say move that the board create a work group to develop allocation options for review and discussion at the August 2021 board meeting? And, and then I don't know how you want to finish it. Yes, Tony, as Lynn mentioned, yes. Uh, so after 2021 board meeting, uh, it would be for discussion. And then. Okay, where, so where, where does the incidental, the incidental catch component of this come in? Well, we can, we, so we can remove the presented to the PDT and, and start um, the, the plan development team would develop options to review the incidental catch, including gear type eligibility. Okay. All right, Kirby, are you satisfied? Tony and Kirby, y'all satisfied with that? Is that clear enough for us to move forward with further discussion? I mean, it's just uh, so that we're all understanding the sequence here. Uh, we, what this substitute motion, from what I'm seeing as staff, this would create a work group uh, that would need to be populated. Uh, either today or following this meeting. And after that work group had put together allocation item or allocation options specific to reallocation of the commercial quota that are then to be presented at the August board meeting, following that a plan development team would also then need to be formed and they would be tasked with looking at those allocation options as well as reviewing the incidental catch provision, including eligible right. gear type. Uh, 
I that's guess how, that's how I'm reading it right now. So uh, I guess Kirby, I'm not sure I'm reading that the PDT couldn't work in sync at the same time as the um, like the PDT couldn't get together and work this summer on incidental catch unless Joe and Lynn, you are thinking otherwise. No, this is Lynn. I think that's fine. Yes, I agree. Well, again, just just to clarify, that it's it's the initiation of a of an addendum that that makes the creation of the PDT necessary. So, in order to have the a PDT, we need to do that. Uh, but I think it could benefit from some clarity in that um, that last sentence. The PDT will uh, evaluate allocation options uh, once they're presented uh, it's a little cumbersome but uh, if, if you're fine with it kirby and tony i can i can certainly live with it we need to carry on our discussions because we are 17 minutes over our time and we are far from finished so i don't want to rush this but at the same time i want to be respectful of our allotted time so um tony and mr. kirby you're okay with this mr chairman if i could just ask maya to uh delete um move that in the in the second sentence i don't think we need the word move again so if we can take away move that okay. and just say the board will create a work group okay all right and i think through your discussion now it is understood that the pdt will take on the allocation um options that the board then brings to them after the august meeting i will say that the pdt might need some clarity on what you you know how do you some guidance on how they should be looking at incidental catch right now there's no guidance here and they'll need something to work off of without that they will have no direction So again, not to put words in the maker second or the, of the motion, but I assume that the, the intent of this is to have them evaluate the efficacy of the incidental catch provisions for their intended purpose. Is that correct? Yeah. I Mr. Chair, this is Lynn Segley. Yes, I believe that is correct. So it's going back and it's looking at what was the initial um, purpose of the incidental catch. And also, um, I think part of the evaluation and looking at options is what is the um, risk of the incidental catch um with the differing gears you know we know that in the situation that maine is in um the the incidental catch uh winds up being a bigger risk to breaching the quota i would think just because you know that's that's where they have to sit in order to catch the fish um when you look at the smaller scale fisheries that really just use incidental quota you know periodically it provide it, it poses less risk to breaching the quota, and also I think some you know um, examination of of the gear criteria. You know what is the difference between a gear that can go out and chase down a school of menhaden versus a passive gear um, that can't uh, that that sits, that just uh, catches menhaden as they swim by. I hope that helps. Tony, Kirby, does that, that help narrow down a bit? I the I guess I the problem that I see here is that it's the board's in the board defined what the incidental the incidental catch was. And it's clear that it's not clear to the states of what that original intention was. And so to ask the PDT 
to evaluate based on something that not everybody's clear on is going to be really difficult for them to do. So I would ask that we have some specific, because like, right here it says to develop options to review the incidental catch. What are, what's the range of options that you're looking for? Um, it, you know, that type of direction for them. You don't have to be specific, but just what are their bounds? That's a fair point. Um, we don't certainly don't want to set up the PRT for failure by not giving them specific direction. Uh, but we seem to be hung up right here and we certainly need to move along. So is there any, what clarifying language can be added to this to remedy the, the situation? Do you have something you can offer? And Spud, it doesn't have to be in the motion. I'm just saying through this discussion, we're going to need some clear clarity of what the P what it is that you want the PDT to look at. And maybe we'll get that out of this discussion from here. I see, you know, you have a ton of hands, so maybe some folks will have some some ideas. Okay. Well let's 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 move forward with further discussion and uh I've done my best to keep up with the list. Uh, folks are sort of popping up and disappearing off my little box down there. So I'm gonna work my way down the way I have them. And the first of those is is Maggie Ware. And then uh, Connor McManus is on the day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I appreciate Joe and Lynn. I think that you guys are trying to find a point of compromise here. I have a couple concerns. And, and my first is that particularly recently, work groups have been extremely contentious in terms of who participates on those groups. And I think that that is going to be augmented and heightened uh, at the Manhattan board where it's a coastwide board. So I can see some pre contentious starts to this work group. I'm also concerned that if the work group is developing allocation options, that is moving into the purpose of a plan development team. And, you know, Lynn spoke with such passion for her fishermen and her fisheries, but that is exactly why. The PET is a better body for this. That is a neutral place for discussion and vetting of ideas. Um, I just think that that is the purpose of the PDT, and we're kind of having the work group take on this identity. Um, in terms of the small scale in Central Catch Fishery, I guess I would plead with people to um, actually call it by what it is. I think there's maybe um, a bit of like misunderstanding as to what this provision is, but in Amendment 3, it is called the incidental and small sketch, small scale fishery provision. And we had this exact conversation with Amendment 3 in terms of is this incidental? Do we allow directed small scale under this? And in the end, the board decided to combine those two ideas into one under that provision. And they did so by creating specific gear types for the small scale fishery and specific ones for incidental. So at the very least, I would ask that the motion reflect what the provisions actually called. Um, in terms of op uh, options that are developed, um, you know, I hope it's not just elimination of a gear gear type, um, that it's broader to maybe considering catch or reducing catch by gear types, whether that's a lower trip limit or days out, um, to provide some points of compromise there. Um, you know, there was talk of risk of breaching the TAC. I'll note we were 70 million pounds below the TAC this year. So I don't think that this, the landings by Maine are jeopardizing our ability to stay under the TAC, but I understand that there are significant landings and people are concerned about them. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I have Connor McManus and then Doug Hamans on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my comments were, regarding earlier discussions on the original motion, not so much the substitute. I guess um, I guess I'll just share a little bit of caution on the idea of um, of recent years, particularly with the past year in terms of how that influenced effort and um, ability to to fish as well as you know, there are some unique instances for certain states that um, had medical hardships and such that may not really reflect um their their long-standing fishery particularly in the last two to three years so i just wanted to pass that out as information because i think that is there are going to be unique situations like that 
for different states that um, is worth thinking about. And I guess perhaps in a larger context, you know, we've talked about um, the distribution of the resource. And, you know, I think when thinking about other species and reallocation discussions, we've talked about, you know, how the resource has actually been redistributed and how we've used scientific information to actually inform that assessment. And I guess I may have a question for staff um, involved with Menhaden, just if they could quickly comment on the availability of, in, of scientific data, either from surveys or assessments to kind of guide or inform that notion of, of a true resource redistribution or shift in the center of biomass or um, whether it's uh, and to what extent, I guess, and whether we there's the ability to bring science to inform any future um, reallocation discussions. Thank you. Thank you. And and we maybe we can deal with your questions uh, when we get to our third agenda item, hopefully, because that's going to deal with uh, the desire to have spatially explicit information uh, on which to base Menhaden management. So I uh, have. Uh, Doug Hamans and then Mel Bell on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually lowered my hand long ago because the point of order was clarified. However, since you called on me, I do believe that I, I think it was Megan a moment ago. I think I could agree with bringing the bullets from the main motion down to the substitute motion so that at least there's a, a starting point that the main motion maker wanted to include. I could agree with bringing those in as part of the substitute motion. All right, thank you. Uh, Mel Bell and then Dennis Abbott on day. Yeah, thanks. I did the same thing. I pulled my hand down, but it's evolved so much. And, and my question was really kind of back to Megan, I guess, is whether or not the second effort, uh, the second, the substitute covered what she, she was attempting to do. It sounded like not necessarily, but as Doug suggested, if you kind of created a hybrid of both of these, maybe you'd end up where you were trying to get. Um, so I, I was getting kind of <laughs> confused in the uh, in the evolution of the substitute. Thank you, Mel. Yeah, I think um, we've often found ourselves down in the rabbit hole on these. So, uh, Dennis, and then I have Eric Reed on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually took my hand down probably 15 minutes ago. However, based on what Mel Bell just said, I agree with him that maybe we should move vote on this substitute motion and then add a amendment adding what Mel suggested by adding the bullet points in Megan Ware's original memo. I think that would be helpful to everybody. But to move it along, let's vote on the substitute and and, and add those, I think is a good idea. All right, thank you. I'll tell you what, if, if everyone can do me a favor, just put your hands down for a little bit, and then those who uh, need to speak, uh, if you will put your hands back up, I'll call on you. Okay, I've got uh, Eric Reed and then Sheree Patterson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I really don't care to have the bullet points moved down. I'd like to see them moved away. It's not to states who have not caught fish in the last few years advantage. But what I would be interested in is taking Ms. Ware's and Mr. White's second sentence and putting that in the substitute motion. Because the way I read the substitute motion now, it says uh, develop allocation options for review. It doesn't really tell you what what's the goal of that. And that second sentence clearly outlines what the goal would be. And, and that would be my suggestion. Um, and I would also like to see the episodic event included in the substitute as well, which I guess is a bullet point. So that, that's, my, that's my two pounds worth of Menhaden. All right, thank you, Eric. Uh, and I have, let's see, I see Nicola's hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I'm still struggling with the substitute motion a little bit. Um, 
and before voting on it, I, I could use clarity on whether the work group is only going to discuss the state by state allocations or the intent is to also have the work group address the episodic event set aside, the incidental limit, and then all of that based on the discussion in August 2021, the PDT is going to be tasked with developing options. I am more comfortable with, with that rather than this dual process of a work group doing part of it and a plan development team doing the other part of it. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me as, as it is right now. Thank you. All right, uh, Kirby, you have another point of order for us. Thanks, Chair Woodward. I think actually Nicola uh, captured it pretty well and it built off of some of the points raised by Megan that, you know, for the board's consideration on the substitute motion, I think it really needs to be clear what each of these two groups are supposed to do and, and when they would be working, because having them both work at the same time, um, from my standpoint, seems like they might be duplicative effort, efforts to, to do work. So I think it really needs to be clarified by the makers what the intent of these two different groups are and when they would be working. All right, we, we've got a little bit of a, a uh, predicament here to extract ourselves out of my, my desire is to call the question on this substitute motion, but I'm not sure that the substitute motion is clear enough for people to make an informed decision about. Uh, again, I've got hands that keep coming up and we're, we're bogging ourselves down in this. Uh, I'm going to call on folks that haven't had a chance to talk. Uh, Cherie, I know you've had your hand up. Uh, will you go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we already have a work group put together for allocation option or for allocation. I mean, why, why are we recreating um, or why are we creating another work group to for this purpose? I think that um, the PDT um, should be dealing with options that are controversial because they can be more objective. So I'm wondering if it would be better to move the um, PDT to actually working on allocation options and the work group working on incidental catch, including gear type eligibility, especially if they're working in tandem um, and instead of working uh, working off of each other. I just think it's going to be confusing the way this is the way this motion is set up. I like the premise of it, and I think that Megan's motion brings all the salient points that need to be brought up. Thanks. Thank you, Art. I'm going to take one more uh, comment, and then we've had a request to call the question. I think in order to clear this up, we need to we need to dispense with at least one of these motions and and you know get that off the deck. And then if we have another substitute motion that's more clear, that's fine. So uh, Emerson, uh, I'm gonna call on you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm not in favor of the substitute motion. I think it just confuses and confounds the process. Uh, we don't need two different groups working at the same time um, on this reallocation issue. I mean, both of these motions, you know, the, the main motion and the substitute both want to initiate an addendum, which I think is fine. I, I'm in support of that. But uh, again, I think having this additional work group just confounds things. And the only difference I really see between the main motion and the substitute um, is the issue about um, the incidental and small scale fishery. It, and, and I agree with Megan that that's what it is. It's not just incidental. It's the incidental and small scale fishery. But I think that that looking at reallocation is going to address some of the issues that some people have about the incidental and small scale fishery. Um, but at this time, I, I cannot support the substitute. Um, but going forward, if the substitute um, does, does not pass, I, I might be willing to 
to support a, a substitute that includes some discussion about the incidental and small scale fishery. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Thank you, Emerson. Uh, Tom, you haven't had a chance to speak. I'm going to give you the last word on this, and then we're going to vote on the substitute. Yeah, um, I think the first motion just basically looks at what's advantage to two states, and that, that's why everybody's having a problem with this. We need to look at the whole problem, and that's why I think the second motion with a little correction would basically address that. And again, we have this team that the executive committee is talking about tomorrow, and that's where we should basically look at the working group to basically look at reallocation. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, let's, I'm going to call the question on this. Uh, um, since this is obviously not going to be a unanimous vote, Tony, how, are you, how do you want to handle this voting? Tony Kirby. If you could ask for the yeses and then I'll read off the states. All right. All those in favor of this. All those in favor of caucus. the substitute motion. Can we motion. Yes. Okay. Uh, have a. I'll give you a few minutes for a caucus. Mr. Chairman, if this motion does pass, if it's okay, if I could ask for some clarity and guidance for each of the work groups, that would be greatly appreciated. Yes, ma'am. That's that's my intent. Is if it does pass, us to try to perfect this to the point that it becomes clear who does what and when. Mr. Chairman, Marty Gary has his hand up. I don't know if it's for a question of clarification. Okay, uh, go ahead, Marty. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Tony, for reading my mind. It is a point of clarification. I, I mean, I may have heard you wrong, but are we doing a roll call by voice acknowledgement? Or are you going to call by state? Or is this something different? It, it defaults to a roll call since I say what each how each state votes so um it defaults that way i don't call out each okay. state's name but i read each state's name so that's just like a roll call okay that's fine thank you okay are we ready to vote anybody uh still need some time for a caucus so so raise your hand up I don't see a hand and uh, we'll proceed with the vote. So all those in favor of the substitute motion uh, signify by saying yay or raising your hand. Whoever is casting the vote for the, the delegation. All right, Mr. Chairman, it looks like the names have settled. So I'm going to read off the state names. Virginia, Connecticut, Delaware, 
Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, New Jersey, and Potomac River Fisheries Commission. Okay. All those opposed. Uh, I'm going to put the. Let me put, let me put the hands down for everyone. Okay. 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 Uh, uh, okay. I'm ready for the next. Okay. okay. All those opposed. Looks like the hands have settled. I have Maine, Georgia, South Carolina, New Hampshire, New York, and Massachusetts. I will put the hands down. Okay. All right. Uh, abstentions. I have two abstentions, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA Fisheries. All right, and uh, last but not least, any null, null votes? I do not have any hands. Okay, okay. so what's the score? Um, eight, yes, six, no, two abstentions. All right, so the substitute motion carries uh now becomes the main motion but before it becomes the main motion uh we need to help staff perfect this so that there's clarity on the roles of the work group the pdt and the board and when this will be done because you know at, at this point now uh if this carries forward and we're not even going to have the basis for developing the specifics of the addendum until um, maybe the annual meeting. And you know, again, that could make it, you know, if the goal is to have this in place for 2022 fishing season, I, I don't know if we're setting reasonable expectations for ourselves or not. But anyway, so. Tony and, and Kirby, what, what can be done to help with this? What do you need? So, Mr. Chairman, I'll start with um, the, the, work, the board work group. As a reminder that work groups are a subset of board members that will be approved by the chair, we will need a chair of that work group, and that the board needs to fully describe the task or the issue that the work group is to address and there should be a very clear directive of deliverables and a time frame for which the board will review that excuse me i'd like to make a point of order dennis abbott go ahead we just now have a main motion we have not voted on the main motion to me we're in a position with a motion available and uh, we're still, it's still available to be amended if someone cares to add a substitute or an amended motion, probably to incorporate what Tony Kearns is saying. But again, I think we got ahead of ourselves a little bit by not voting on the main motion at this point. Well, my, my intent here, Dennis, was to help address the concerns of staff to make sure that the motion that is going to be voted on is clear to everyone who's voting on it. Uh, and you know, I was hoping for more friendly amendments so that we could get the clarity there because there's, I'm sure there are people on the board who, if they vote on it right now, they're not exactly sure on what they're voting for. Yeah, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're doing a good job under difficult circumstances as usual. Bye-bye. No. So back, Tony, let me yield it back to you. you, you so Mr. Chairman, if we had a, a directive for, you know, right now to develop allocation options, it would be helpful to have a directive that provides some guidance to that work group, unless you just want it to be everything under the sun. Oh, that's, that's not acceptable. <laughs> that's not fair to the PDT, and I don't think it'll yield her productive result for the board to deliberate upon. So um, and then we could so the motion, and then we can come the back. maker and the second of the motion. You know, I'm gonna put this back on the maker and the seconder of the motion. 
So when I see uh, Joe and Lynn, uh, let me call on y'all. Um, let's try to get this thing across the finish line. It's 4.30, so. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah, yes. I'm sorry. You know, I really apologize because I have such bad connectivity problems, and this is definitely derailed in a way. I would like to try to make a friendly amendment to clear this up. I think first, there should not be two groups working on this, working on two different things simultaneously. A work group of the board should discuss allocation options, it should discuss the incidental and small scale fisheries, and it should discuss uh, the episodic, episod episodic set aside and all of the complexities therein. Um, and the board and the work group of the board should bring that to the um, to the board for review and then to the PDT. And I also very much agree with Eric Reed's um, comment that the second sentence, I think, of Megan Ware's motion that outlines the goal and objective should be moved into this motion. So I think we need a specific goal and objective. And I think that the work group needs to come up with how they want this addendum to be shaped. I think right now, what we don't want to do is go out of the blocks being too prescriptive. I understand the conflict with the current, the, the overarching allocation work group, but the overarching allocation work group is going to work on allocation as a bigger picture for all species. This is something more urgent. So I think we need to get some board members together and we need to discuss how we want this addendum to look and bring it to the PDT and then they start working. All right. Uh, so we've got a suggestion. Uh, Joe, let's make the motion. Uh, are you receptive to some, some amendments? Yes, thank you. Lynn's Yes. Um, you know, as, as the last however amount of time was painfully proved, um, it's difficult to craft a motion that covers everything. The substitute was a concern that the first motion was um, just too simple and, and, and didn't cover enough. So I think the working group would need to look at that. And I certainly support that the working group then would look at incidental and and the you know the small scale fisheries as as one. All right, so we need we need some words. We need some words in this motion. To, to Mr. Some Chairman, clarity we need. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, this, yes, is, Emerson go ahead. Has, this is Emerson Hasbrook. I, I'm a little uncomfortable in terms of what we're doing right now. I mean, this motion no longer um, belongs to the maker and the seconder. I mean, this was a substitute motion that the board just voted on. And to allow the maker and the seconder to now modify this, um, I, I don't know, I'm looking for some guidance here um, in terms of Robert's rules. I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with this process. I don't know if anybody else is. Thank Could you. I offer something, Dennis Abbott? Go ahead. Thank you. Emerson is exactly correct. The, the motion does belong to the board, but it is open to amendment. And I think that the amendment could be offered by Lynn Fegley, who was the second of the first motion. And I might suggest that we take a five minute pause and allow Lynn Fegley and Mr. Chairman and Joe Semino to come and uh, Kirby to come up and Tony Kearns to come up with the correct words and come back in five or so minutes and give us a amended motion that we can vote on. And then we'll, I think we'll clarify things very much. And I'd like to also add that I think there should be complete separation between the allocation work group and a work group assigned to deal with mandating. They're two separate issues completely. And I don't think we want to get bogged down with the overall, like Lynn 
put it the overarching allocation issue. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Tony, Bob, Kirby. Um, we, we need to extricate ourselves out of this. Um, the, the suggestion that's been made, I'm certainly fine with that. If we think we can perfect this to the point that uh, staff has clear direction and that the board knows exactly what it's voting on or what to expect. So, Kirby, Tony, thoughts? Um, Mr. Chairman, if you're amenable to a five minute recess, um, Lynn, the, the difficulty in this is that Lynn can't hear everything that we're saying because she's in the car and she cannot see what is on the screen. So um, being able to communicate with her would be good. But I see that Bob's hand is up so we can try to go from there. Go ahead, Bob, and I have a question for you too. Okay, I, I just want to chime in on a couple of things. You know, technically, this is property of the board and it should be modified. I know, you know, we always try to do this and sometimes it backfires, you know, try to try to quickly modify this on the fly to, to craft what the original intent was. But, um, you know, we may need a substitute motion here, uh, which we can which we can work on during a quick break. But just I also wanted to chime in real quickly um, and comment on the allocation work group and sort of control expectations for tomorrow's executive committee. There's not going to be a, a grand presentation tomorrow by any means. That group hasn't met yet. Uh, they've just defined their uh, first meeting date and their membership. Um, and, and tomorrow's update is really to ask the executive committee if there's any additional direction they want to provide to that group. So I think that allocation work group's a, a, a longer term project probably than than the timeline most folks have talked about here today for Menhaden. So I don't I don't think you want to wait on the allocation work group necessarily for this Menhaden. Um, addendum if you go down that road thanks bob and, and i've been asked a question and and frankly i guess i should know the answer to this maybe i do but i'm going to ask you and that is uh is i've been asked whether you can table this motion have work on it between now and policy board and have it brought to the policy board for consideration i know we do that at the council level i don't recall us doing that at the commission level yeah, at the commission, we try not to do that, try to keep the species issues at the species boards. You know, I think if we had a break or something right now, maybe we can facilitate something. I, you know, I think I think the idea that Lynn raised uh, about, you know, let's set up a working group, take on those three projects, which are allocation, um, small scale incidental catch and uh, episodic events, and maybe weave in that second sentence from Megan Ware's um, original motion uh, that was that was substituted i think that that gets that seems to get at a lot of what folks are um talking about here it may make people comfortable i think it it solves the problem of, of concurrent pdt and work group activity so um you know i think a, a small group of us can probably turn that into a um a substitute motion if that's if you're comfortable with that approach mr chairman I am, and so I'm going to uh, let's, let's recess the board uh, until uh, I'm, I'm going to say 4:50. There is the language of the substitute motion. I need a maker and a seconder of that up uh, that motion. If you'll please raise your hand. I've got uh, Joe Samino. Does that make the motion? Yes, let's move this along. So this is a substitute motion okay. group to develop a statement of the problem for reallocation. So the goals of this action are to better align jurisdictions, commercial quotas with current landings and fish availability, while providing a level of access to the fishery by all Atlantic Coast jurisdictions and reduce the need for quota transfers. And uh, hopefully we'll get a second. I do I have a seconder of this motion? I'll, I'll second it. Spud. Dennis, Dennis Abbott has seconded it. Okay. All right. Uh, we've talked all around various versions of this uh, for a, what seems like a small eternity. Um, so I certainly I want to offer opportunity for discussion, but let's please try to keep it keep it brief. Uh, Megan. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yikes. Okay, this is a bit different than what I was expecting. Um, I'm disappointed that we're no longer initiating action. Um, I'm struggling with the purpose of the work group. I think we answer the purpose of a statement of the problem in the following sentence, the goals of this action. So I feel like we have already fulfilled the task of the work group in the second sentence of this motion. Um, I can't support this. Okay. All right, Sheree uh, Patterson. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have similar reservations about this, as well as there's no timing uh, involved and when that's coming back to the board. I liked having uh, some sort of end date for us to be looking at this. Thanks. Okay. All right, uh, Joe, is your hand still up? Well, yes. I mean, I, well, yeah. I mean, I, and I apologize, but I, I think that this should be. I agree with Sheree, and I think that the the intent here should be for this working group to have this back by August, by the August twenty twenty one meeting. I agree. That should okay. be. Yeah. All right. Can we get some language in there to address these concerns? Because um, we are we're running out of time here, folks. And it's an important issue, and I don't want to give it short shift. Um, sure, at the same time, we've got to make sure that whatever we we approve is is going to accomplish our our intended outcome. So, Mr. Chairman, based on what Joe and Dennis just said, um, that they meant to have that language in there. Maya, could you add um, the work group? will report back to the board at the August 2021 meeting. That's yeah, I'm, I'm certainly fine with that. It's... And Chairman Woodward, just to, to clarify for the board, you know, after voting on this, there will be the need uh, following this meeting for that work group to be populated, a chair to be appointed. Um, so those are th those are things that I think the board should be aware of. All right. Uh, I think what I've heard is some concern, at least I heard from Megan, that, uh, that we've got uh, some lack of clarity here. Um, Again, just just an effort, in an effort to move this along. If if the language of this were to, to create a work group to develop options to better align jurisdictions' commercial quotas with current land and fish availability while providing a level of access, so forth, so on, and then the work group would report back to the board, would that satisfy some of the concerns that I've heard, Megan specifically? Sorry, is that a question to me, Mr. Chair? Yes, I'm just um, again trying to uh, maybe running a little rough shot over parliamentary procedure here, but trying to get this. If we basically to create a work group uh, to develop options to better align jurisdictions and so forth and so on, allocation options. Um. So, so take out the part of the problem statement. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's better <laughs> as it, than it is now. Yes. Okay. Can we can we make can we make some adjustments to this, Tony? Is that possible? We work with this on the screen. If the maker and seconder are amenable. Yep, amenable. Yes. Knowing that I'm very strict on parliamentary procedure through the years, today I will relax my objections to doing things as we are because we do have to move this along, as Spud is saying. The idea is to get this yes. airplane off the ground right now. That's, I think, yes. what we're trying to do. Maya, 
it would be motion uh, substitute motion to create a work group and then delete the rest of that sentence to develop a work group to develop options allocate to develop allocation options to better align jurisdictions so forth so on and Maya, you have that you have that there. So just um, uh, you just need to delete the words. Um, yeah, there you go. You got it. I think. Yes. Okay, Emerson, you got your hand up. Thank you for being patient. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, my concern with the substitute motion is that we've just spent whatever it's been two two and a half three hours here talking about the original motion that megan had which was to initiate an addendum the substitute motion which is now the main motion to initiate an, an addendum and now the substitute motion which was supposed to resolve some of the issues and questions we had doesn't say anything about initiating an addendum and i thought that's well that's uh, that's where i wanted to go today was to to initiate an addendum and that's gotten just deleted out of this and i don't recall in any of the debate that we've had over the past couple of hours about not initiating an addendum so i don't know if i can i uh, i don't know that i can support this substitute motion based on the fact that it just takes out of the discussion, initiating an addendum at this time. Thank you. Well, I guess my, my response to that is that we got to have some basis on which to develop a draft addendum. At this point, we don't have that. So the suggestion has been made to develop a work group that would come back to the board and present to the board options for consideration that would be the content of that draft addendum. And if I'm not representing that properly, Tony or Joe or Lynn or anybody else, certainly correct me. You are, but this is just the first step. I think the understanding would be that in August, the addendum would actually be initiated after we get the results of the work group. So then why isn't that part of the motion? I think we have to realize that we're all working remotely and it's hard difficult hard to put you know the exact words i think there has to be a little bit of trust involved in where we're going at this point just my opinion well if it makes folks comfortable i mean that last sentence could be modified the work group will report back to the board at the august 2021 20, meeting and the board will initiate an addendum at that time does that address your concerns, Emerson? Yeah, I, that address that. That's good. Yes, that's fine with me. Thank you. Is that okay with uh, the maker and the seconder? As well, the seconder is fine. I've heard is, you're fine with that, Joe. Yes, I, I support that. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Rob LaFrance, I haven't heard from you. Go ahead, Rob. Uh, I agree with everybody. It's very difficult to do this thing remotely. But one of the things I wanted to add was it seems that the um, review of the incidental catch, including gear type eligibility, seems to have fallen out of the second motion. Um, I think most folks agreed that we would be looking at that as part of the overall uh, structure of the, of the work group. Um, just a point of view that I, I'd like to see that added. Can you offer some specific language for consideration? Sure. I think we we could add to better align jurisdiction commercial quotas with landings and fish halibility. Had all that that stuff, and then before and add uh, review the incidental catch, including gear type eligibility, comma and reduce the need for quota transfers. So basically take the last line to we'll develop options 
to review the incidental catch, including gear type by eligibility, and putting that as the just before the end. Okay, Tony and Maya, can we we can capture that? I know this is this is tough, and I apologize for everybody. As long as it's okay with the maker and the seconder, I can help Maya. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Chair, okay. you know, over the ten minute break, that's exactly what the intent here was. So my apologies once again. Do you find with this, Dennis? Yeah, I guess. Rob, if you're, oh, I mean, the other part is, is that we know that that is part of the intent of this work group through this discussion. So it doesn't have to say the words, but if it absolutely needs to, then we'll put them in there. I, I was just seeking clarification on what we're supposed to do as a work group so we have it. I mean, it's, it, I know it's a long sentence, but I think it adds part of what we were trying to get to. Okay. So, Maya, after, um, the I think she has it in there now. It looks like I, I did put it yeah. in if that is correct. Yeah. I think it I is think correct. Perhaps we could uh, develop options to review in front of incidental cap. I think the purpose of the work group, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, is to review the incidental catch provisions, including gear type eligibility. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes, Mr. Chair. Okay. Okay. And my, if you could add so provisions shoot. after catch. Yeah, provisions behind catch, right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Okay. Um, we have a substitute motion. Are there, is there any other discussion? Uh, Bob Beal? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just, just to, I don't. Want, I'm not going to suggest adding anything else to the the motion, but I think the idea of episodic events is also part of the charge to the work group. You know, the, all these all these pieces together work together on allocating Menhaden uh, quota to the commercial right. fish. It's the state shares, it's the incidental catch, and it's episodic events. So I think that's all fair game, and and just if everyone understands that what they're voting on here. We don't we don't need to modify the motion just want to make sure everybody knows that good point thank you for for bringing that up i think that certainly is the intent uh okay um last chance any comments suggestions discussions if not i'm gonna call the question so all those in favor of the substitute motion signify so by saying yay Okay, Mr. Chairman, when the hands settle, I will start to read the, the states. I have okay. um, Virginia, Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, Georgia, South Carolina, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, New York, North Carolina, New Jersey, Maryland, Massachusetts, and Potomac River Fisheries Commission. I will put the hands down. Okay. Ready? All those opposed, all those opposed, signify by raising your hand. I have Rhode Island. Sorry, Tony. That's. Okay. Uh, that's that an error. An error. Yeah. Okay. Strike, strike Rhode Island. Okay. I have no hands um, for those. Okay. Uh, null votes. Don't see any null votes. Abstentions. I have two abstentions U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA Fisheries. All right. Thank you. So I believe that was uh, the motion carries. The motion now becomes the main motion. So uh, I'm going to do this hopefully simply. Is there any opposition to the main motion? Any null votes? 
Any abstentions? To note for the record, we have two abstentions, NOAA Fisheries and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. Thank you everyone for your patience and for working through this. I know this is a difficult topic made more difficult by and we're all scattered over thousands of miles from each other. So I think we uh, now the next challenge is going to be to uh, identify the members of the work group and to have a chair and to get this this body working on the task at hand. And so uh, Tony and Kirby, what are our what's our options for doing that? Mr. Chairman, we can. Um send an email requesting nominations for the work group. The chairman uh, appoints the, the members to the board and then requests and then also asks for someone to be the chair of that work group is what we have done in the past. Okay. We will um, just try to get that done as expediently as we can once the meeting week's over. So um, I converse with Kirby. Uh, our third agenda item uh, is important. Uh, I don't believe we can give it uh, the attention it needs uh, at this time. I think everybody's probably exhausted. Uh, so I'm going to recommend we defer discussion of that till our next meeting uh, so that we can give it adequate attention. You have the written report. I would ask that everybody take the time to look at that report, uh, to be thinking about it. And so when we convene, in August at our next meeting that we can give some direction to the technical committee and the uh, ERP work group as to what our priorities are for moving forward with uh, you know, getting spatially explicit guidance on Menhaden management. It's, a, it's an ambitious undertaking and we need to give them guidance to focus their efforts. So um, that this point, is there any other business to come before the uh, Menhaden board. If not, do I have a motion to adjourn? Adjourn. All right, I have a motion to adjourn. Thanks, everybody. Uh, it's, it was a hard task, but I appreciate everybody's hard work. So, I guess we'll see everybody tomorrow virtually.